All right. Well, siblings in Christ, it is a great joy to be with you this afternoon. I bring greetings from two presbyteries, the Presbytery of Great Rivers, which overlaps in some of your areas. We go from river to river, from the Mississippi to the uh, Illinois River, although technically we kind of go past that. We're not quite sure. It's, it's about four hours one way to four hours another way. And then also from the Presbytery of East Iowa, where I started uh, May 1st. So that is, is a new venture for me. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I know you've got a, an introduction as well, but I am PCUSA clergy, and we are in full communion. Um, yes! But I want to uh, I want to go with who am I in context, and the reason why I think this is important is because. I will be presenting today out of my worldview. And we all have our own worldviews and our own understandings of how we see the, the world, the church, and our part in the church. And I think it's important for you to see how I see things so that when you hear that, you understand. So who am I in context? Well, I am seminary trained but in my seminary trained, I am seminary trained more biblically conservative. I went to the University of Dubuque Theological Seminary, which is in its 10 PCUSA Presbyterian uh, seminaries. It is known as one of its more conservative presbyteries. And so that is where I went. And I would say that I grew up in a PCUSA con uh, congregation that was more biblically conservative as well. But then, once I entered into the church, I became more biblically, um, no, I was not talking to you, ah, my phone just ran out, okay, more biblically liberal. And what I mean by that is, as I began preaching, as I began learning, as I began entering into these conversations with others, something started to strike me as, that can't be. There has to be more. There has to be a different understanding, a different viewpoint. There's got to be more to the story. Um, I am married. My husband and I have six children. Now, that is a big statement, but it's broken up into two pieces. My husband brings three children into our marriage. And we have three children together. Uh, total, our children are ages 34, 31, 27, almost 28, 9, 8, and 4. <laughs> yes, we are a non traditional family. Our grandchildren, our grandchildren are 9 and 4. <laughs> That'll be fun when they're graduating. We may have to split that up where we go. And so the work that I do now, the work that I do is clerk work. Um, this means that I spend my job, I spend my life constantly reconciling people and rules and how that goes together in the church. Also, an important part about me right now is that I am working towards my master's in mental health counseling. Uh, and what this means is this is the, um, this is the, uh, the master's requirement to become a licensed therapist. And so that is what I am working towards now. I love learning. Learning is very important. And this one, this next one, that is going to be very important. Okay, do not let the gray hair confuse you. I am a millennial. Okay, yeah, yeah. Now, I am what they refer to as a geriatric millennial. <laughs> Did you know this was a thing? Yes, I am a geriatric millennial. 
And what that means is that I didn't have computers and that form of technology until I got into middle school. And so while I didn't grow up with the technology at my hands uh, when I was entering into school or younger, um, I'm not afraid to troubleshoot how to use it. So uh, that will become important later on. Um, I've served in non-ordained and ordained pastoral roles for 17 years, and I just left. And that's going to be an important part of my story, too. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Now, where is the church going? All right, I want you to turn to your partner, or turn to the partner next to you. Find someone. Ask what were you doing in 1990? Turn to someone. What were you doing in 1990, and this is some type of 1990s car. Now, I'm not exactly sure what kind of car that is, but it looks a lot like... What? Okay, see, I thought I thought it was... I thought it was a Nissan. That's exactly what I was going to say. So my... Uh, the first car I drove was my mother's 1988 Nissan Pulsar with T-tops. Close enough? I'm good? Okay. All right, we're good. All right, so now, when I asked you where you were in 1990... I saw that most of you were able to turn and give some type of um, conversation about where you were in 1990. Now, are you ready? But, now you're not there yet, I know, you can't figure out where you're going, where But. Yeah. 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 2050 is closer than 1990. Does 1990 feel like it was just yesterday? Okay, maybe it doesn't for everybody. <laughs> I've changed a little bit since 1990, personally. First, second grade, I'm not sure. But, if you pick up any book out of this, Yancey Strickler writes a book called This Could Be Our Future, A Manifesto for a More Generous World. Has anyone heard of that one? It's not a, it's not a religious book, but it's fascinating. And he talks about what 2050 could look like. And he talks about, in particular, about how generations of 30 years and what a change looks like and how the average change takes a generation of 30 years. Now why, why is 30 years important for us? What does this mean for us? And more importantly, what does this mean for the church? Now here's why. In the year 2050, the United States majority will not be white non-Hispanic. 
In the year 2050, the United States majority will not be able to pretend to be the center of Christianity. Yeah. That feels startling to us. But remember that 2050 is closer to us than 1990. And in 2050, only one-fifth of the world's three billion Christians will be non-Hispanic white. Now, this next one is where I find I often get a little eye rolls. Okay, so I'll just warn you in advance. In the year 2050, the world and the church will largely be run by millennials and Gen Z. So let that sink in just a little bit. In the year 2050, this next generation that we are looking at, the church is going to be run by millennials and Gen Z. And not just the church, the world. The church and the world. Now, you might not feel hopeful about that. <laughs> I do. And here is why. But first of all, we have to get through some hard times first. Fear. Change is hard. I don't know about you all, but in the Presbyterian Church, we have a joke that goes something like this. How many Presbyterians does it take to change a light bulb? Change? Who said anything about change? Ah, right? We don't want to change. We don't want to do anything that's going to take us out of our comfort zone. And more importantly, change asks us, but what about me? What am I personally going to have to do to allow that change to take place? Now here's the thing about saying that the next generation of millennials and Gen Z are going to be running the church in 2050 is are we who are running the church now, and I'm using collective we, are we willing to hand the church over? Are we willing to prepare the church and hand it over? Ah. That feels a little frightening, doesn't it? Now, how can, we have to ask ourselves personally, how can I be hopeful and adaptive at the same time? Now, I'm going to be honest here. Richards and O'Brien says, Generalizations are always wrong and usually helpful. <laughs> okay? So I'm making some generalizations. I'm going to make some generalizations. I know that in these generalizations, they're not always true. Okay? There are going to be some outliers. And when I say something about one generation, such as the millennials, it might not stand for every millennial. I'm sure every one of you could stand up and say, I know a millennial who does not fit into that category. Okay. Same for baby boomers, Generation X, all of it. Like, I'm aware of that. So we're going to make some generalizations that are probably wrong but helpful. All right. So what does it mean for many of our mainline American churches such as the PCUSA, for which I'm a part of, such as the ELCA, if it is run by millennials and Generation Z. Now here 
is where you remember earlier about my worldview that is constantly trying to reconcile rules and people. Well, millennials don't follow rules. <laughs> millennials put ethics above rules. Millennials look at a situation and say, what is the ethical way to move forward? Not just what has someone told me I need to do. That is the rule. Now think about how that might play out in the church. Because we have a lot of rules, don't we? Don't we have a lot of rules? I know in the PCUSA we have a lot of rules. And it is my job as the stated clerk of two presbyteries to constantly interpret and make sure those rules are held up. But the millennials say no. Morals and ethics are first. Now statistically, statistically, and again, this is a generalization, statistically, millennials are the most inclusive generation. They are the most inclusive generation. What does that mean for our church? Now, I'll tell you that in the PCUSA, we've gone through some hard times. You and the ELCA denomination, you have uh, you're a few decades ahead of us. Our siblings in Christ in the Methodist Church are going through some of that strife now. It's been hard. It's been hard to move forward. Millennials are not afraid of change. They're not afraid to do something different. Tradition means nothing. What is tradition to them? Tradition's just one of those rules of something that someone has told them that they have to do. And lastly, Millennials are more socially aware, globally aware, earth conscience. They are aware of what it means to care for the world, to care for the environment, to care for one another. Now that, again, doesn't mean that there are no generations that do that before millennials, but it just means that statistically, Millennials are doing that at a larger rate than the prior generations. The next point, what does it mean for the American church if Christianity is not the majority? Because friends, we are entering into a time when we cannot claim, and not just whether or not it's true, but we seriously cannot claim that we are the majority religion in this country. But I think, I think that we are about to encounter something even greater than just not being the majority religion in this country. I think that what we have seen in our climate, our religious religion, and our climate in the last five to 10 years is that I think we could see a big split of Christianity. And I think we will see that along political lines. I will see, believe we will see that around how we interpret scripture. We're seeing it in our denominations. 
already, as I've mentioned, and I think we will continue to see that in a much broader way within our country. One of the questions we ask ourselves is, is Christianity dying? Is Christianity dying? Now, here's the thing that is really interesting for me as I study, is that when we take in what is going on in our world, we take it in in our worldview and in our cultural context, which is very individualistic. That's who we are in our Western context. It, it just simply is. But not all cultures look at what it means to care for a community, what it means to be a part of the church, what it means to be a part of the, of the environment in an individualistic point of view. And so when we, in our American context, and even in our mainline denominations, when we look at Christianity, we first think of our numbers, our numbers are dying, our numbers are declining. I will tell you that in the PCUSA, our numbers are declining rapidly. Maybe you're experiencing that too. And our numbers of pastors who are coming in, who are being ordained to be ministers of word and sacrament are also declining at a very serious rate. When I was first ordained as a minister of word and sacrament, one of the first committees that I served on was called the Committee on Preparation for Ministry. And my job um, was to oversee the committee that helped inquires and candidates who were going through seminary preparing to become ministers of the word and sacrament. And at that time, uh, just 13 years ago, we had anywhere from six to nine candidates and inquirers. Now, in our presbytery alone, we have one. They're not there. They're not coming in. There's a void that is happening. And so that's our worldview. We see our numbers declining. But Christianity and the church is not dying. Christianity is growing incredibly fast. Just not here. And so one of the things I think that brings hope is will we see in our American culture, will we see influences from other areas that are collectivist cultures, will we see their influence into our, our and I use, you know, our, our churches? And I think that we will. And to me, that brings us new hope because I think that's going to open for us an opportunity to see the gospel in a new light in which we don't see the gospel as about us, but instead we see the gospel as what it means collectively to be the people of God. And so that brings me great hope. But... There will be growing pains. There will be labor pains, as the church has experienced over and over again. What will happen to our institutions? And friends, what will happen to our buildings? Because we all have those questions in the back of our minds. Do I dare say... that sometimes our buildings have become idols that we have set up 
and we worship higher than God, God's self? Because I know I experience that in my work on occasion. I'll give you two examples, one of each side. I have, actually I'll give you three. I have one congregation who was dwindling in numbers, but they still had enough money, they could have continued on maybe two, three more years, keep paying the light bill. They had probably about 20 members, and they came to us and said, here's where we are. We have so much money in the bank, and we have about 20 members, we could keep paying the light bill and dwindle down until all of our resources are gone and keep being the church. Or what we could do is we could close our building now, sell our church, disperse ourselves to other congregations, and give our money away. And that's what they chose to do. I've got another four congregations who all belong to the same city area, who this coming Sunday will all become one congregation. Four buildings, four separate congregations, but they all have the same missions. And they said, they finally said, what are we doing? Why are we all struggling to operate differently when we all have the same goal? And so three of those churches have sold their buildings, and friends, we are in a market to sell. <laughs> three of those churches have sold their buildings, and this coming Pentecost Sunday, they will be one, chartered as one congregation. Praise be to Jesus. I've got another congregation. They've been approached to combine with another church. They have nine members. And they said, we've got nine members. Three of them are in the nursing home. We are not going to do a thing until those three people die, and then we'll talk to you. Okay. What do you do? So again, what will happen to our buildings? How is God working? How is God working? I told you earlier that one of the things that I'm working on personally is a master's in mental health counseling to become a licensed therapist. And one of the things that the generations that are coming, and of course we do this too, right? We do this as pastors, is we value relationships. And I believe that the future of the churches are going to be so much more relationship-bound than rule-bound. They will be so much more relationship-bound than rule-bound. We will value caring for one another and one another's needs as a community than we will value caring for our buildings and for our assets because what's going to happen and what we are seeing in many cases is that a lot of us are going to lose our buildings. And I know that feels like a detriment, but it also opens up this wellspring of opportunity in what we can do. What can we do for the gospel of Jesus Christ when we're not shackled to a building that costs us so much and we can't keep it up? Those are the questions that we're asking ourselves over and over again.
We've all heard it said that there's this large group of nuns. Now, the first time I heard this thought, I thought it was N U N. What? What are we talking about? Nuns? This large group of nuns. The large group of nuns, not religious. I disagree. I absolutely, wholeheartedly disagree that there is this huge group of nuns out there. What I believe is that they have been hurt and traumatized by the institution of the church. And they have vowed that they will never set foot in a congregation again. And that is where I believe our calling to reach out and value relationships over rules and relationships over buildings is going to come for. I don't believe that there are people who don't believe out there anymore. This large group, there are some, absolutely there are some, but I believe that they are hurt. And I believe that's why we see this group of people who have written off the church. It isn't God they don't want. It's the institution. So what are we? Pastors, members, lay people, what are we going to change and do for the future of this church? To bring them back, maybe not into the church building, but into relationship with God. How will we show them a God who is gracious and compassionate and merciful and kind and loving that may or may not have anything to do with a building or with a congregation that meets on a Sunday morning? So what do we need to start doing? Well, I will tell you that as the state clerk of two presbyteries, what I will tell you is that we need to start recognizing who isn't coming. Statistically, whenever we are going to make a big change, whenever any group of people is going to make a big change, you've got the 2.5 group of people who are going to jump on that bandwagon and go with you wherever you're going to go without any questions, right? And then you've got the 95% of you who are going to say, I've got a lot of questions and who are going to want um, a lot of information. And then you will eventually over time show them that this is the way to go. And then you've got the 2.5 people who are never, percent of people who are never going to come with you. You are never going to convince them. And pastors, I've been a pastor, you know who they are. And friends, it's okay. It's okay. And it's okay to say it's okay. And when we start recognizing who isn't coming, like that church that I said that's got nine members, we look at other ways that we can start combining mission and we can start combining congregation. And I appreciate your sister, your sister congregations and the ways that you can combine mission. And we start looking at what it means to be together. I also think there is going to be a huge shift in our churches where we are not going to have the quote unquote minister of word and sacrament leadership anymore. Now, I'm a minister of word and sacrament. I know many here are, 
But as I mentioned, the, the cohorts that are coming in are not in the droves that they were before. And so we need to get creative on what that looks like. And we have to stop recognizing that our pastors and our young families are the saviors of the church. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, because what happens is that we have churches that keep holding on, thinking as soon as we get the pastor, everything's going to be fine. I have these conversations on a weekly basis. As soon as we, and you're, you're laughing because you know it's true. Um, as soon as we get the pastor, or if we could just get five young families, right? Okay, what do young families come with? Children. Yes. What do they not come with? Money and time, right? They will not save your church. They will not save your church. All right. And we have to change our framework from what can't we do to what is possible. What can't we do for what is possible? And this one is for my friends out there, especially my young millennial ministers of word and sacrament. Friends, we have to plan for vocationalism. We have to plan for vocationalism. Because the reality is, is that in these creative natures that we are going to, the sustainability for full-time pastoral calls for ministers of word and sacrament is not going to be there as we move to 2050. Now, some of that seems dreary. A lot of that seems dreary. That's what you asked. You asked me to come say my future. What I okay, <gasps> okay. Oh, me. So what do I? Okay. So I'm excited. Now, how can I say all of that and say that I can be excited? Because I believe, I wholeheartedly believe that my children and my grandchildren are going to change this world. And I believe that they are going to change the future of this church. And I believe that in the depths of my soul. So much that I'm willing to make the changes that I need to make now. So that I can hand off to them when they are ready the church that they need to move into the future. And that is why I left the church that is now. is so that I can do the work that I need to do, which is not the case for everybody. This is simply what I needed to do. So that I can do the work that I need to do now so that I can hand them the church for their future. My job, my job now, is to work with approximately 140 clerks of session to help prepare their churches for the future. And in the meantime, I see my future ministry as counseling people who've been hurt by the church that they may encounter our risen Savior in a way that is different and is a way that provides for them a loving understanding of who Christ is for their life that may or may, may, or may not involve the institution. And that's how I'm called into this future of the church. And I know that each and every one here today, no matter how young or how many years you have, we all have a calling into whatever this future looks like. And that excites me. Because I know that Christianity is not dying. I know that while our churches are going to go through some significant changes, and here are some resources that are some of my favorites. 
I have hope. I have hope. And I've got five minutes left. <laughs> Should I, any questions? I don't know. Well, first, let's thank her for, for this. <laughs> And uh, are there questions? Does anyone have? We do have a couple of We do have a few minutes, yes. Questions? Comments? Well, once again. Well, thank, there was oh, one in there the is one that's, No, no, step to the mic. Could you step to the mic, please? Sorry. You mentioned a book earlier as you started your presentation. Could you give us that resource also, please? The book that you were talking about. Yes, it's up here. Is it? Yep, Strickler. This could be our future manifesto for a more generous world. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, um, just, just briefly. Um, so, uh, and I, I kind of talked a little bit about, um, so the bottom one here is Phyllis Tickle. Has anybody read her book, The Great Emergence? Yeah, she talks about the rummage sale and how the church goes through the 500 years, every 500 years, and how way overdue. I think that's what we're seeing. Yeah. So, those are just some of my recent resources. Go ahead, do the mic. And while, while they're coming, just uh, for reference, actually, peanut butter M&Ms are my favorite. Just so. one, of, one of my pastors said to me one time that uh, she thought that the you know, young people are not the future of the church, they're the church now. How do you think that um, especially mainline churches can heed those words and make sure that the church is an inclusive, welcoming place for young, young adults. Sure, sure. Well, and um, absolutely, absolutely, they are the church now. Um, I think that we're all the church now. Um, while I would say that in theory, that's a, um, that's a great idea um, for us all to behave like youth are the church now. Um, the reality is, is that most of our congregations don't behave that way. Um, and the reality is, is that there will come a day um, in the very near future um, where there will be no other choice, where those who are the youth now will be, um, will be those who are running the church. Um, yes, I absolutely would love to think that all of our congregations are behaving in a way where the youth are fully participants of congregations, but I see all too often where children, youth are kind of shielded or pushed aside in congregations. But if we could behave differently, that would certainly be different. Uh, before you start, we're going to get to the normal protocol, which is expected. Give your name and the congregation that you are with, and then go from there. Microphone two. All right, Adam Dixon from Faith Lutheran Church in Jacksonville. Um, you gave some great ideas on how churches can work together in this. How about denominations? What can we do with you or others? Um, is How important is that in what we're doing as well? Sure, um, I don't have a lot of great answers that way. I mean, let's be honest, we continue to split in so many different ways. I think every year we just have more and more denominations. Um, un having full communion is certainly helpful um, because we can share pastors across those denominational boundaries. Uh, and I think that we are going to see more and more of that where um, our ministers can go back and forth. I think that there are probably missional ways we could partner better 
Um, unfortunately, what will probably end up happening is that either some of our mainline <coughs> denominations will get to the point where they are no longer sustainable and will be absorbed in some of to the other mainline denominations, um, or they will join for those same reasons. That could be a hot button issue. Maybe I should. <laughs> uh, Pastor Mark said he retired St. Mark Belleville. I just had another question come to my mind as I was walking up. So I don't know, do I just have one question? Yep. Okay. <laughs> I will go with that question then. A lot of what we're talking about here is demographics, social trends. What about the theology of our situation? And, and as you've been saying, the gospel that we have. I mean, that's the driving force, and that's our mission. Um, so how is that the answer and not just how we do ministry, right? You know, pull in young people or, you know, whatever kind of um, trend is going on. Huh? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, great question. Um, I think that in some ways we have to see them as almost almost connected um, because the gospel the gospel message is growing, um, but it is growing demographically and. In our country, um, in our demographics, the gospel message isn't growing. Uh, and so how do we hone in and understand what it looks like where the gospel is growing? I think, you know, the, and I might not be answering your question correctly. I know what I'm trying to say in my head, but maybe not out loud as well. The reality is the global south. Um, Christianity is growing at a tremendous rate in the global south. Um, and, and yes, it is, it's bound by demographics, um, but it's the, the rules, I guess you could say, the rules for Christianity in the global south are very different than the rules for Christianity here in the United States. And, you know, we might we might see a need to care for another. You know, like for example, um, you know, we might see a need to know that there's a, a a a family that's in need, right? And so, here in the United States, if there's a family in need, we might help them out by um, by giving some money or giving some food or doing something along that lines, where in some parts in the global south, the gospel would see that almost sinful, that we wouldn't take that family into our home and, and feed them our own food and, and house them under our own roof. And so the rules of Christianity almost become different. And so when I use demographics to explain how Christianity is growing, it's because those demographics really do lend to how it grows so differently. Does that answer or nothing? Or maybe we just A little bit. Yeah, okay. I think more conversation. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Good. This will be the last one. Would you check to see that that is on? Do we even have rules about what microphone to use? Uh, Pastor Pat Monroe, chaplain of Lutheran Hillside Village in Peoria, member of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Peoria. I have a simple question. What's a stated clerk? <laughs> 
Oh my, that is not a simple question. <laughs> That. that is not a simple question. Let's see, what do my many roles entail? Okay, so I'm the parliamentarian of two presbyteries. Um, I teach parliamentary procedures. Um, I run all disciplinary cases, um, so I do all the judicial process. I, am, uh, I serve as a resource person for all the committee work, and um, I keep all committees in check. I make sure that everything done is done decently and in order. I, um, I help with a lot of property procedures. Um, let's see, I, yeah, it is a lot of rules. My life is bound by rules, and yet at the same time, same time it's not, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.